Welcome everyone to Pathways to the Orchard. Today we're going to be learning Parsha Bahalotcha from the book of Numbers of Midbar. We have a number of insights to share. And we'll start with an idea that in many Parshiot, there are many, many different uh, events or incidences or mitzvot or stories. And sometimes it's very, very clear the connection between all of them. And other times it's a little bit harder to see the connection between all the different parts. Therefore, what we can see, though, is that certain parshiot have, a, I'll call it a theme, that runs through the portion. So tonight, we're going to look at a theme that runs through Bahalotcha. And that is the idea of lifting up, raising up. And we'll see it very consistently, even though there are many, many different things that are occurring. So with that in mind, we're going to look at many different uh, verses and see the theme of lifting up uh, repeat itself many, many times. So we start with the actual name of the parsha, Bahalotcha. And this is in the second verse of the of the eighth chapter. And it says, Daber al-Aharon v'yamarta lav v'halotcha et nerot el mul p'nei ha-menora ya'ero shiva t'nerot. God is speaking to Moshe. Speak to Aharon and say to him, when you, and here I'm going to give two definitions. It literally means when you light the lights of uh, the menorah, you shall light seven lights. Now the word here for to light is bahalotcha. Bahalotcha literally means to raise up from the word aliyah. As we'll see, that will repeat itself in this parsha a number of times. Aliyah is the name we give it to someone who um, moves to Israel, who raises up their level by coming to live in Israel. So here is, it, it means literally when you lift up the lights. So Rashi comments that, in other words, why that kind of language when it's clear what it means is when you light, when you ignite the fire of the menorah. So he says from this we learn that the, the task of Aaron was not just to light the menorah, because I think everyone's had experience, you light a candle, and sometimes it sputters out. You light it, you, you think that it's going to stay lit, you turn your back and it, it's no longer lit. So Rashi says that the, the, the job, the task of Aaron is to light the lights in a manner until he would see that the flame would rise up, would be established on its own. In other words, it didn't need uh, human intervention anymore to make sure the wick is perfectly set up. It is on its own now. But the language that it uses is taken from Bahalotcha, raise up, until he would see that the flame would rise up on its own. Then Rashi makes a second comment. He says, from this, the sages understood that because the menorah was not a, a small 
uh, ritual object. It was placed on the floor and it, it rose up. And so the sages learned that, that there was a small stepping stool that Aaron would rise up on, he would step up on in order to light the candles. So Rashi learns two things from this special language of Bahalotcha. The, the next thing in the Parsha is about the Levim. And here we see this is part of the consecration of the Levi'im. It's actually been mentioned in a number of different parshas. It was a very important concept where the Levi'im became the replacement of the firstborn. And they had all kinds of uh, special, uh, call it jobs or tasks in the Mishkan, later in the Beit HaMikdash. And in Israel also, they were the, the, the tribe was separated because it did not receive an inheritance. Instead, it received cities spread out all over Israel. And so here, as part of their consecration, so they would bring, they brought offerings. And here it says that among the different offerings that they brought was uh, a, a sin offering that was considered an elevation offering, Ola Hashem. The Ola offering was a special type of offering where the entire offering was consumed on the altar. Most of the rest of the offerings were eaten, at least in part, by the Kohanim and or the people who brought the offering. But there was a special type of offering called the Ola offering that was completely consumed. So that was one of the offerings that they brought when they were being consecrated into the service in the Mishkan. And then it says about the Levim as well, that when they, they, would, they had to wash their clothes, which usually means that they had to dunk their clothes in a mikvah. And then it says, Vayinef Haron Otam Tnufa Lifnei Hashem. And it says that Aaron waved the Leviim, a wave offering before God. So what does this mean? It means Rashi explains that quite literally part of the ritual of the Levim entering into the service was Aaron lifted them up and waved them. Wave them means like we shake lulav. He would wave them to the six directions like we do, like we do lulav. So this is an, an amazing thing that each of the Levim were physically, literally lifted up and were shaken to the six directions. That was part of their entrance into the service. Here again, we see the theme of lifting up. And here it doesn't mean just uh, psychologically, emotionally, even though that obviously was part of the intent was to literally lift them, lift them up. Then the next subject seems to uh, change uh, gears altogether. And that is the episode where Israel uh, kept Pesach in the desert. This is their, their first opportunity after they left Egypt the following year, but there were a number of people who were impure because they had been in contact with a dead body. They were doing the mitzvah of actually burying 
a uh, someone who had passed away, but they became impure. You could become pure, but it was it was a uh, ritual that lasted seven days, and this occurred right before Pesach, so they were not able to bring the Paschal offering. So they came and they complained to God, and for those who follow our living with the times, just uh, a week or two ago was Pesach Sheni which is taken from this incident where they came to Moshe and they said, like, we also want to bring the, the Paschal offering. We were doing a mitzvah. Why should we be prevented? So God, Moshe actually did not know the answer. He turned to God and God said they deserve a second chance. That's why Pesach Sheni, the second Pesach, is called the holiday of second chances. And so God revealed to Moshe that any person who was impure or was too far away and they couldn't make it to the uh, temple uh, by the, the day before Pesach, that's when we brought the Paschal offering, they would have another chance on the 14th of Iyar exactly a month after the 14th of Nisan, they would have a chance to bring the Paschal offering and eat it with matzah and moror, the bitter herbs. And therefore they could uh, do the mitzvah. They could fulfill the mitzvah. So what, what does this have to do with our theme? We know that the three pilgrimage holidays were called Aliyat HaRegel which in English we translate as a pilgrimage holiday, meaning everyone had to come up to Jerusalem. And because Jerusalem uh, is on the top of uh, a mountain, the idea is when you come up to Jerusalem, you are lifted up spiritually. And so therefore in Hebrew, the pilgrimage holidays are called Aliyah Tarego, which means lifting up the foot. Because in those days, people had to uh, either walk or ride on an animal that was walking. Now we get in, in a car and we come up to Yerushalayim. But in those days, either you walked or you rode on an animal. But either way, it was called lifting up the foot because you're being lifted up spiritually by coming up to Jerusalem. So here, this is the, the, the people who were impure. Now, this took place in the Mishka, in, in the desert. And so it wasn't in Jerusalem, but uh, God was giving the mitzvah for the, for the future as well, not just for the 40 years in the, in the desert. The next thing that happens in the Parsha is, remember, we're in the second year of their 40 years in the desert. At that point, it's the plan was to go into Israel. They were by Mount Sinai for uh, very close to a year. And then they began the trek to Eretz Yisrael. And we learned in the Parsha Bamidbar the whole procedure for marching in the desert, how the tribes camped and which tribes were in which of the four directions surrounding the Mishkan, the tabernacle. And here it says, and uh, anyone who wants to follow, we're now in the ninth chapter, the 15th verse, it says, Ubiyom hakim et the mishkan, kiseh anan et the mishkan, la'oa la'edut, ube'erav yia ala mishkan, b'mare esh ad boker. So here it's explaining the idea that 
the Torah has explained before, but it's going to explain again that there was a cloud of glory in the Mishkan, and it hovered over the Mishkan. And as long as that cloud hovered there, it's stationary, they knew that they weren't moving. They were staying wherever they were camped. How did they know when it was time to move? When the cloud would move. And then they would, they would uh, uh, actually uh, wrap up and prepare the Mishkan to, to be moved. So here it says, it's actually in Yud Zion, the verse 17 that I want to get to. It says, Ulefi he'alot ha'enan me'al o'el ha'o'el ve'achrei ken yisu b'nei yisrael. So it says, and according to the rising up of the cloud, that is when they knew that it was time to travel. And then, So now they're marching through the desert. The cloud of glory is ho still hovering over the tabernacle, but it was moving. And they were moving with the Anan. And then it says that where the Anan would stop, that is where they would know that they should stay. Well, how did the Anan move? So it says, Al pi Hashem Yisau b'nei Yisrael, Al pi Hashem Yachanu. So they would know because it was, God was directing the Anan. It was by the word of God that the Mish, that the cloud would travel. And it was by the, the, the word of God that it would halt and B'nai Yisrael would do accordingly. Here again, I'm bringing this because the, the whole procedure for traveling in the desert was dependent on the when the cloud would be lifted up. So we see this theme is running through everything in the Parsha, the idea of lifting up the menorah lift the, uh, the Levine being lifted up in order to enter into the service. The people wanting to make Aliyat HaRegel, a second chance with Pesach Sheni. They wanted to come up to Jerusalem. And here we see the whole idea of their traveling in the desert was according to the lifting up, and then the resting of this cloud. And then it, it, it explains they would, uh, they would blow the trumpets and they would know how to march in the desert. And then in the 10th chapter, the 11th verse, it says, Vayahi, now, all of that was just instruction. But here it, 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 it then tells us exactly what date they actually moved. Remember, they had been camped for close to a year at Mount Sinai. And here it says, And it was in the second year. In the second month, that's the month of Iyar, Be'asrim B'chodesh, on the 20th of Iyar, Na'aleh Ha'anan Me'al Mishkan Ha'idut. The cloud lifted up, rose up from above the tabernacle. And this was the first time since they had been camped at Mount Sinai that the cloud rose up. And then it explains how they how they marched in the the desert.
After that incident, Moshe speaks to his father-in-law, Yitro. Here he's actually called Chovev. And Rashi brings down that he actually had seven names. Yitro, the father-in-law of Moshe, had seven different names. Here he's called Chovev. And it, it confirms that he is the father-in-law of Moshe. And so Moshe says to him, if you remember, Yitro joined the Jewish people, became Jewish, and uh, stayed with Israel for about a year. And now uh, we're, uh, Israel is on its way to Israel. Again, we don't know at this point that we would end up being 40 years in the desert. The plan was to go into Israel. In fact, it's the next Parsha where the whole incident of the spies occurs and the decree comes down that they would wander for 40 years. But here, Moshe speaks to Yitro and says, we're going to Israel, and it's, it, it's, it's a good place, and God is going to be with us. Come with us. Again, I already mentioned that going to Israel is called Aliyah, coming up to Israel. So here he is, in a sense, trying to convince his father-in-law, who has been with them for a year, to stay with them and to come up to Israel with them. In the end, Yitro decided not to, and he returned to Midian. And the commentaries tell us that he returned to Midian in the hope of converting people in Midian. But again, here is the same theme of, of Aliyah. And then in the tenth chapter. Lamed Hay, 35. So this is a, a very, very important uh, two verses. I wrote about it extensively in Orchard of Delights. Therefore, I'm not going to go back into all of those details. But here you have two verses, and we repeat them until this day, anytime we take out a Torah for a public reading, we read the first verse, which I'll read in a minute. And when we put the Torah back, we repeat the second verse. These two verses are bracketed by inverted nuns, the letter nun backwards. It, 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 it looks a, a bit like parentheses. This is the only time in the Torah that we have such a thing that you have two verses bracketed off. Based on this, the sages say, from this we can learn that these two verses can make up an entire book of the Torah. Two verses, which means that if you look at the book of Bamidbar, the fourth book, it actually could be understood to have three books. In other words, you have from the beginning of the book to these two verses. That's one book, as it were. These two verses make a second book. And then from after these two verses to the end of the book is a third book. Now, usually... We only talk about five books. That's why it's called the Chumash, meaning five. But here the sages say that these brackets, which don't occur anyplace else in the Torah, are indicating that these two verses are so important, they're considered as if a book to themselves. So what are the verses? 
says, Vayihi bin So Aaron, Vayomer Moshe. And it was that when the Aaron would travel, here again, we're talking about when the whole camp would move. The Aaron only moved as part of the Mishkan moving, and we just learned that the Mishkan didn't move until the cloud rose above it. So it says, and when the Aaron would travel, Moshe would say, Kuma Hashem, Hashem, get up, rise up, elevate, as it were, elevate yourself. Kuma Hashem becha and scatter your enemies, and those that hate you should be scattered from before you. So here we see a very important thing, because here we're really talking about the enemies of Israel. And yet here, Moshe is saying to God, your enemies. So this is like one plus one equals two. In other words, Israel's enemies are God's enemies. And God's enemies are Israel's enemies. That's the first verse. And we say this when we take the ark out of the, uh, take the Torah out of the ark in, in a, a, a modern shul, because this is like the ark uh, moving. The Torah that was kept in the ark in the Mishkan were the two tablets of the law and the, the original Torah that Moshe wrote. Now, the second verse is we say when we put the Torah back, where it says, Ubenuchu, meaning when the Mishkan would rest, and therefore all of Israel would set up camp and rest, Ubenuchu Yomar. Moshe would say, Shuva Hashem Rivavot Alfei Yisrael. God return to the multitude of thousands of Israel. Because while they were moving, it, it, was, it, it was as if everything was in flux. But when they came to rest again, so Moshe, in a way, was inviting God, God, now rest once again and return your presence to all of Israel. As I said, the the uh, ramifications of these two verses, and especially the meaning of these inverted nuns, uh, one could look in Orchard of Delights. But here the idea is Moshe is saying to God, Kuma Hashem, get up, rise up, elevate yourself. That fits in with our uh, theme uh, very, very very strongly. So here we will we'll we'll stop and just review this idea that uh, this is not the only parsha that is like this. Many many times, if you look at a parsha, it will be self evident what the theme is, or how everything in the parsha is connected. One thing moves uh, uh, effortlessly into the next thing. Other times we have a number of different incidents. And here we identified a theme, but this is good to remember for other parshas also, to kind of look for the thread that is connecting everything. So that was our first insight. Now we're gonna to return to the menorah. That's how we started the Parsha. And there is a concept in Sefer Yitzira when it, it's talking uh, about the letters. The Sefer Yitzira is the, the, the first book of Kabbalah, really, the most ancient. And it deals almost exclusively with the 10 Svirot and the 22 letters, mostly the 22 letters. It begins with the Sfirot, though it doesn't name them, 
It gives over the concept of 10 Svirot and their importance. And then the 22 letters. And there, excuse me, the concept is revealed, the idea of that each letter manifests itself in worlds, in souls, and divinity. This idea was uh, picked up by the Baal Shem Tov, and he connected it to the three uh, floors of the Ark. But in the Sefer Yitzira, it's not, the Baal Shem Tov called it worlds, souls, and divinity. But in the Sefer Yitzira, it, it's, it's also a paradigm of three we'll call it types of dimensions, but it's called olam, shana, and nefesh. Olam means world, which means space. Shana means year, which means time. And nefesh means either body and or soul. The Baal Shem Tov took these ideas and he in a way, reframe them into the idea of worlds, souls, and divinity. Which is not exactly the same, but the same kind of concept of identifying the, the, the dimensions of reality. So in the idea of olam, shana, and nefesh, means that each of the letters will have a physical manifestation in the world, in time, and in soul. So here, the menorah is a ritual object of seven branches, a central column and three branches on each side. As we'll see in a minute, this is the secret of symmetry that you have one in the middle and then three on each side, uh, very symmetrical. So the number seven, of course, in Judaism is such an important number. It's repeated constantly. But here we're going to see how it's uh, manifest in olam, shana, and nefesh. So in, we'll start with actually the middle one, Shana, because this is the one that's most uh, identifiable and uh, part of Jewish lifestyle. And that is that all cycles of time are based around the number of seven. There's seven days to the week, six days of creation, and the seventh day of the day of rest of Shabbat six days of work, and then the day of rest, Shabbat. So our lifestyle is based around Shabbat. Every seven days is Shabbat. Svirata Omer, we see the idea of seven weeks, counting seven times seven weeks. In months, we see that the, all of the pilgrimage holidays Pesach, Shavuos, and Sukkot all occur during the first seven months of the year. Pesach is in the first month, Nisan, and then and Shavuos is in the third month. And in the seventh month is Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot, and Sim Simchat Torah, uh, Shmini Etzeret. We now refer to it as Simchat Torah as well. But they're all happening in, se in seven months. So here we see cycles of seven days, seven weeks, seven months. Then, of course, we have the sabbatical year, seven years. Then we have seven times seven years. And then we have 6,000 years of history and the anticipated 7,000th year of Mashiach. And then we have the world to come. And that is referred to as either 49,000 or 50,000 jubilees. So here we see all of time is based on seven and is represented by the menorah. We have 
in mourning. When someone passes away, then we have seven days of sitting Shiva, seven days of initial mourning. When a, a person in ancient times, and even today, in the laws of family purity, that there would be what are called seven clean days, seven purification days before a person could go to the mikvah or, and become purified. We, we have a, 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 at a wedding, so we have the, the bride going around the chatan seven times, but then the whole wedding uh, procedure goes on for seven days. Seven, repeating seven brachot. So here we see in time, shana, the number seven. In olam, in space, so the sages say that there are seven continents. There are seven oceans. There are seven heavens. There are seven fruits of Eretz Yisrael. So all of these are in space. We, we make seven hakafot uh, during Sukkot. So this is the number seven manifest in space. And then in nefesh, so as I said, nefesh can mean body or it can mean soul. So we're told that in the face there are seven gates of, we'll call them gates of perception. Famous book, The Gates of Perception. Because our senses are, the four of the five physical senses are based in the, in the head. We have two eyes, two ears, two nostrils, and one mouth. Seven components to the face of, of sight, smell, hearing, and taste. Only touch is uh, outside of the face. So here are these seven gates of the nefesh. This is how the soul perceives the physical world. And we also have the seven shepherds, these are the special guests that we invite during Sukkot. The seven Ushbizim, Avram, Yitzhak, Yaakov, Moshe, Aaron, Yosef, and David. These in the soul, because each one of us is included within them, and they're included within us. Rob Ginsburg explains that the seven heavens are actually seven levels of meditation that through seven levels of meditation, one can perceive the seven heavens. So here is just a, uh, a beautiful way of taking the teaching of the Sefer Yitzira, that every letter, every sphera, and according to our tradition, all of reality, are based on the building blocks of the 10 spherot and the 22 letters. And so each of the letters manifests in either, not either, all three of them in, in space, in time, and in soul. But here we see it all in the menorah. And that is the beginning of this Parsha is the menorah. Now we'll move on to the next insight. And this is this is very connective because we said that the menorah, perhaps more than any other symbol, is, is the, uh, the, the picture of, is the paradigm of symmetry. And you see behind me the Mug and David. And it's interesting because the Mug and David, in a certain way, is very connected to the menorah. Because the menorah is a central shaft with three 
branches on one side and three on the other side. And we're told that the middle branch is Shabbat. And there's three days leading up to Shabbat and three days after Shabbat. Shabbat is the, the central focus of Jewish life, even though we usually think of, and of course it's correct, of six days of work or the six days of creation and then Shabbat. But we're also told that there's, there's a parallel paradigm where Shabbat is the middle. That is, in our experience, Shabbat is the, the main focus, even though it does come after the six days of work. And then we have our rest. But in a certain way, in a certain perspective, it is the middle. And so you have three days on one side and three days on the other side. But the actual form of the menorah is the epitome of symmetry. If you look at the Mug and David, so the Mug and David is also based on triangles, two triangles. And uh, one triangle is, is, is two extreme points that meet in the middle. And the other one is two points that meet in the middle. And so you have, actually, if you look at the Mug and David, you have six external triangles. It's made up of two triangles, but it forms six triangles around a hexagon. In the middle is a hexagon, a six-sided figure, and that's called Shabbat. Shabbat is the middle of the, of the hexagon. So that is the Shabbat. And these are the six triangles those are the six days of creation or the six days of work surrounding the Shabbat. So it's very actually very similar to the concept of the menorah. And of course, the Mug and David is also the epitome of uh, symmetry. So in this Parsha, there's a very interesting connection to Hanukkah. So right at the beginning, the first thing Rashi asks is, why does this Parsha begin with the menorah? The menorah has been mentioned before a number of times. So why does it have to be mentioned again here? So the first thing Rashi says is one of the main ways of uh, learning, uh, and that is uh, the method of juxtaposition. So the first thing Rashi says is, why does this parsha begin with the menorah and Aaron lighting it? So he says it's connected to how the previous parsha ended. The previous parsha ended with the 12 uh, uh, tribes, the 12 princes of the tribes bringing gifts on the 12 days the first 12 days of Nisan, when the Mishkan was uh, inaugurated, was erected for the first time, and the service began in the Mishkan on the first of Nisan. And then each day for 12 days, one of the princes of the tribes would bring gifts. So Rashi says that it begins with the menorah, because uh, the, the Midrash explains that our, the, the, the Levites, the Kohanim, did not bring gifts. And they had the idea, let the other princes give. And at the end, we'll, if there's anything like left over that's needed, we'll bring also. And so the 12 princes brought so much that Rashi says that Aaron's uh, spirit became humbled and he felt like we kind of missed out on this. We didn't, uh, whatever we would bring now would be insignificant and his spirit dropped. And so the Midrash says that God says to Moshe, tell Aaron that he shouldn't feel bad because his lighting 
the menorah is is so precious in 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 God's eyes, and there's an an eternal aspect. The princes brought the the gifts. It was a one time uh, offering, but Aaron would be lighting the menorah every day. But both the Ramban, who quotes a number of different sources, and the Balaturim say that this Midrash that says that you're lighting the menorah is eternal was hinting to Hanukkah. Because after the first temple was destroyed, they weren't doing the service. They weren't lighting the menorah. Then they built a second temple. But then the Greeks uh, took it over and defiled it. But then the Maccabees came, and the symbol of Hanukkah was the relighting of the menorah. That's why we light a Hanukkah, and we light it for eight days, but it's based on the, the lighting of the menorah, which had seven branches. We light it for eight days because the, the tradition that they only had enough oil for one day, but it lasted for eight days. So the Ramban, the Balaturim, and they, like I said, they bring other commentaries. See, this is all hinting to the idea that after the second temple is destroyed, well, there is no more menorah, there's no more service, but the lighting of the Hanukkah that was taken over by each and every Jew is the continuation of the lighting of the menorah. And so God says, don't feel bad because what you do is eternal. So here we see a beautiful uh, hint to Hanukkah. But there's more. And that is when we talked about Pesach Sheni. So Pesach Sheni, again, the people were impure and they wanted to bring the Paschal offering. And God says to Moshe in the future, if anyone is impure or too far away physically, they couldn't make it to the temple, they have another chance. So the, the sages discuss what does it mean too far away? And so there are different opinions that are brought. One of the opinions, it's in the Mishnah. The Mishnah says that if someone is farther than Modi'im on Erev Pesach. It's now the 14th and the, the offering has to be brought by, uh, by the end of the day. And what happens to a person like he came all the way from Babylonia, came all the way from, who knows, Yemen, Saudi Arabia, and they just couldn't make it. But they were getting close so the circumference around Jerusalem that marked what was too far away was from Modi'in and outside of that. And the Bartanura explains why Modi'in. Modi'in, we know that was the home of Matatiyahu and Yehuda Maccabee and the five brothers. So it's, it's very, very uh, uh, important in the whole story of Hanukkah. In Modin, that's according to one version, that's where the revolt against the Greeks broke out, was in Modi'im. And so here, the Mishnah in Psachim says, Pesach, if you're too far with you too, if you're farther than Modi'im, then you have another chance. If you're inside the circumference of Modi'im, so the Bartanur explains why Modi'im. He says, because if someone would get on a donkey at daybreak in Modi'im and in that same distance in all directions, they could be at the temple in enough time to bring the carbon Pesach. In other words, there's a one day travel that they could make it. The other opinion is, is too far away. Let's say you're, you have to imagine, let's say you're in the old city and you, what, 
for whatever reason, time runs out. You can't make it to the Temple Mount. You're like hundreds of meters away. You would still get another chance. In other words, too far away means like everyone has another chance. So here, though, the fact that it mentions Modi'im, well, this is another hint to the whole idea of Hanukkah. Now, for us, this is very significant because we, in 1976, uh, established our settlement in Mivo Modi'im, Ma'or Modi'im. And what is interesting to, to note is virtually everyone of the original settlers, the Garin, the core group, were all Baal Tshuva. Were all people who were very far away from their Jewish roots and returned to Jewish observance and practice. And so this, it, it, uh, for us who live here, this has always been very significant that this Mishnah in, in Mesechet Pesachim, it talks about if you're farther away than Modi'im, you get another chance. And so for us who settled the modern Modi'im, we have to understand that right now there's a city called Modi'im, which has 100,000 people, and it's being planned for a quarter million people. But we were here first. When we were here, there was nothing else in the area. Now, the whole area is settled by uh, the different um, small settlements, larger settlements, and most of them have the names connected to Hanukkah. We're Mevo Modi'im, which means coming up to Modi'im. The city is called Modi'in. Then you have Maccabim. One of the settlements is called, after the Maccabees, Maccabim. You have Lapid, which means a flame. You have Matityahu, the father of, of the five brothers that began the revolt. You have Modi'in elite, the upper Modi'in. And then you have Hashmonaim, the name of the family of the Maccabees. So this whole area is named for the story of Hanukkah. And it's hinted in this Parsha, the idea of Pesach, saying everyone has another chance. That's in a sense what a, a Baal Tshuva is. No matter how far away someone might get from their, their Jewishness or people who become converts who come from very far away or people who don't become converts but uh, start observing the seven mitzvah of B'nai Noach coming from very, very far away and then get close to the God of Israel, to the Jewish people, to, to the land of Israel, to the Torah, and even people who don't even take on the seven mitzvot, but are just lovers of Torah, lovers of the Jewish people, lovers of Israel. So everyone has a chance to come close. But now there's even another hint, and that is going back to the idea of symmetry, that on Hanukkah, uh, uh, the Shabbat of Hanukkah, every Shabbat we read what's called the Haftorah, a section of, uh, of the prophets. We read publicly from the Torah, and then afterwards we read a section from the prophets called the Haftorah. The Haftorah for the Shabbat of Hanukkah and for this Parsha, Bahalotcha, is the uh, is from the prophet Zechariah, and it's about coming back from Babylonia, Persia, and rebuilding the second temple. And the prophet Zechariah has this vision of the menorah, 
And his vision is actually the symbol of the state of Israel. It's a menorah with olive branches, which represents peace, uh, wrapped around it. That is the official symbol of the state of Israel. It comes from the vision of Zechariah that we read in this Parsha and Shabbat Hanukkah. It's one of the only Haftorahs that is repeated twice. Why I'm mentioning that, so it's obvious because it's talking about the menorah, but what's, what's the connection with Hanukkah? So the connection with Hanukkah is it ends with the words, chen, chen, la, which means grace, grace to her. Rav Ginsburg teaches that the word chen, chen is a very, very important word. It is uh, uh, one of the um, descriptions, as it were, of the of the uh, attributes of God is finding grace in the eyes of God. The first time it's mentioned is by Noah, that God looked at the world and he just saw evil, unfortunately. And it says that God regretted in his heart, of course, this is anthropomorphic language, that God regretted in his heart that he had created man, and he was going to wipe out man and start all over again. But the last verse of the, of the first portion of the Torah, Bereshi, is, Benoach matzachen be'enei Hashem. But Noach found grace in the eyes of God. And then the next parasha begins the idea, these are the generations of Noach. Noach was a tzaddik in his generation. And God saved the remnant of humanity through Noach. But the first time Noach is mentioned is Noach found grace in the eyes of God. So the idea of finding grace in the eyes of God, Moshe, after the, the golden calf, pleads with God to find, not just for himself, but for all of Israel to find grace in the eyes of God. Please forgive the people that we should find grace in your eyes. But this verse, Noach found grace, if you notice, the name Noach is Nun Chet, and Grace is Chet Nun, opposite. And so based on this, Rob Ginsburg says that when the word Chen is used in the Torah, it's talking about this kind of beauty of symmetry. There, there are uh, 13 actually uh, uh, attributes, excuse me, eight attributes of, of beauty. And one of them is chen. So we said before that the menorah is this uh, paradigm model of, of symmetry. And Hanukkah, of course, the, the, the Hanukkah also that uh, you'll have in many Hanukkahs, you'll have the shamash in the middle and four on each side. Doesn't have to be that. The, the shamash could be at the end. But still, the idea is based on the menorah, the idea of one in the middle and three on each side. So also, especially the lights of Hanukkah, the, the type of beauty that comes from light is a light of 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 pain, of, of, of symmetry, of feeling unity. Symmetry means that everything is balanced and one can feel the unity between things. So th these are the last words of the Haftorah of this Parsha and of Hanukkah. And the idea of the lights of Hanukkah, the lights of the menorah, is this idea of chen. 
So here we see many, many hints to the idea of, of Hanukkah in this Torah portion.